right. Welcome to the comic writing panel of the Pflugerville Public Library LibCon. Today, we have four guests joining us uh, in no particular order. We have Paul Benjamin, is a New York Times bestselling author who has written and produced comics and video games for diverse properties, including many Marvel characters such as Hulk, Spider-Man, and Wolverine, many DC characters in the DC Universe Online, plus Disney princesses, Star Wars, Star Trek, Starcraft, World of Warcraft, The Muppets, Monsters, Inc., G.I. Joe, and more. He is a contributing essayist in books about Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, G.I. Joe, and others. His first prose short story appeared in the Protector's Anthology. His original manga series, Pantheon High, was a Yalsa Great Graphic Novels for Teens nominee. Next up, we have like, Shannon Brewer. like Brewer. the whole bio that you, that you just yeah. memorized. That was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I got a cheat sheet. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Shannon Brewer. She lives each day as if it were a fantasy. Whether exploring the worlds of her imagination or dressing up as a member of someone else's, there's never a shortage of creativity to be had. Shannon is a professional host, a young adult author, and the writer of the musical comic series Evolution Revolutionaries, starring the band Free Runner as they make true change in the world. When she's not doing that, she's usually gushing about comic books with her Hops Plus Heroes team, hoping to inspire young people to understand the value of reading, writing, and the strength inside themselves. In Shannon's world, every day is a new adventure, and every adventure is a story waiting to be told. All right. Next, we have Janet Harvey, is an award-winning writer of comic books, movies, and games. She's written for Oni Press, Image Comics, and DC Comics, including the first full-length adventure of Cassandra Kane. Her graphic novel, Angel City, is out from Oni Press. She's writing the upcoming graphic novel, The Curie Society, from the Einhorn Epic Productions and MIT Press. And I'm very excited about that. And last but certainly not least, we have Sean Kelly McKeever is an Eisner Award winner for his comics writing, which includes Spider-Man Loves Mary Jane, Teen Titans, The Incredible Hulk, Mystique, Birds of Prey, and Outpost Zero. Sean's also written for animation and video games, including the award-winning Star Wars, The Old Republic. He's online at seanmckeever.com. All right. All right, let's go in the order I introduced you. Did you enjoy reading comics as a kid? If so, which ones? Paul? Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, is the very short answer. <laughs> uh, I, I remember I started... I started with like Richie Rich uh, and a little bit of Archie, but I was always more interested in Casper and Wendy and the hot stuff among like the Richie Rich pantheon. Like I was already veering towards the fantastical characters. Um, and then my brother, I remember I was about eight years old and my brother said, oh, you watch the Super Friends cartoon. You should read the Justice League comics. Uh, they've got all the super friends plus Martian Manhunter who can turn invisible and read minds and walk through walls and change his shape. I was like, this, is, this sounds amazing. And I started reading comics with superheroes in them and just fell in love. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember the, the uh, Wonder Twins from, uh, was it the Saturday morning mm -hmm. super friends? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was always a big thing. And my brother and I always, you know, Wonder Twins activate. <laughs> I always I always got mad at the Wonder Twins because like every once in a while they would like do their Wonder Twin powers activate before a mission and then go on separate missions, which is already the dumbest like logistical <laughs> idea. Just exactly. Uh, but I was like, why don't y'all just high five every morning and store up a charge? <laughs> yeah. Invariably, oh, we just can't quite reach. <laughs> How about you, Shannon? Um, I actually grew up on Riverdale Street, so I thought oh, I wow. lived in the same place as Archie and Betty and Veronica. So I read a lot of their comics as a kid. Um, and much like Paul, I veered towards the more magical, spooky. I love Sabrina. I thought Sabrina was the greatest thing ever. The fact that she just had all that magic, but then still managed to get into like the most ridiculous hijinks and also had great fashion. She had everything like a little girl could want to believe was possible in life, like magic and great clothes and all the adventures you could want. And then was still a part of all of that world. So I read that 
And that was kind of my mom's thing when I would go to the store. Those were the comics I could buy. But my brother got to get all the superheroes. And so he was reading Superman more than anything. And I would steal his comics after he would leave his room. And only when he would leave his room and have to put them back <laughs> before he came back. Because if he found out, it was all like kinds of drama in the house. And so I would read his Superman. And I always thought Lois Lane was the greatest thing ever because she didn't have any superpowers. But she was still fighting like all these bad guys, always going like right into the heart of trouble and trying to like bring down the truth. And she's still doing that with great, wonderful titles to this day. And I think that Lois Lane was one of those characters we needed in a fantastical world to have like this normal character who could just come in and say, you know what, but you still have to stand for truth and you still have to do that, even if you don't have superpowers. And so she kind of inspired everything I did from then on as like a child into adulthood and my outfit today. So uh, yes, yeah. yes. That's awesome. There's a new kids graphic novel coming out, uh, Lois Lane and the Friendship Challenge, that yes. it's aimed at younger kids that I think it's just awesome to, you know, build her up and make her more of a well-rounded character, you know? I already have it and it's wonderful. <laughs> oh, good, good. <laughs> All right. How about you, Janet? Um, it's funny because I, you know, I grew up in the 70s, as I'll tell you how old I am. But when I was really little... I remember my mom coming home with that issue of Ms. Magazine that had the first adventure of Wonder Woman in it. Mm -hmm. And it just blew my mind. I was like, oh, you know, comics. And um, that was that was my first sort of introduction to comics. Um, but I read them a lot when I was a kid. Um, anything with a woman on the front was really my favorite. I wasn't really into like Richie Rich or Casper or or more of the kids comics, but I was really into Red Sonia, Ooh. which was because I liked fantasy books. Mm -hmm. So I loved Red Sonia. Um, I remember when Spider Woman number one came out. Um, I bought that one thinking it was going to be worth something one day, and I think now it's worth like three dollars and fifty cents. It's worth it's worth forty to sixty dollars, just so you know. Is it really? Because yeah, awesome. I lost it, but then somebody got me like the full run of like the first 12 issues, yeah. like yeah. much later. So I do have that whole run if it is worth 40 to 60. Issue yeah. one, it's worth about. I'm not going to sell it. Yes, but don't, yeah, I was like, but don't sell it, keep it. <laughs> Never, no. I, it meant so much to me. In fact, I have, I should bring it over here. I have a lamp that's, I got at um, Austin Books and Comics that's like pages from Spider Woman number one. That I love. So, um, but yeah, anything, anything with a girl on the cover, I was there. Supergirl, Wonder Woman, um, Spider Woman were my were my faves, and Red Sonia. So, <laughs> awesome. That's great. And last but not least, Sean. Um, yeah, I mean, reading comics as a kid is, you know, I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here right now uh, if not for that. Um, I, you know, we had some comics around the house when I was little, and it was mostly like. Actually, it's funny Janet uh, mentioned them. I was like trying to name check in my head. I'm like, oh yeah, Richie Risk, Casper, <laughs> Hot Stuff, all those kind of the um, Harvey comics and that of the 60s and 70s um, that my older siblings uh, were reading. But it was really between reruns of the 60s Spider-Man cartoon and then on a children's television show called The Electric Company, which oh, yeah. uh, I don't know if it exists in some form now, but... Um, they would have live action Spider-Man uh, uh, segments on the show, but he wouldn't speak. He would have word balloons and thought bubbles uh, speaking for him. And that was kind of my introduction to the idea of comics. And then I saw a Spider-Man comic book in, in a uh, pharmacy and begged my mom to buy it for me. And I must have been uh, like three years old at the time. And she bought that for me. It was an issue of Spidey Super Stories. And that was the start of it. And I was a... I read almost nothing but Spider-Man until probably like I was 12, you know, um, that was, that was my whole deal. I learned to read at an early age from comics. Cause I, I didn't want my mom to be reading them to me anymore. I wanted to know what they were saying myself and be able to just sit there and absorb them, you know? And, and so I learned a lot of vocabulary uh, back then. Um, and yeah, that, um, that was, that was my jam growing up. And I even, you know, when I was 14, I opened up a comic book store in my parents' hardware store. Uh, which it started as a four foot rack and then it became like about 250 square feet of space, you know, towards the end of it, where I was a full service comic shop in a 
town of 1200 people. It was, you know, so yeah, I guess I, I guess I read them when I was young and liked them a little bit. <laughs> awesome. All right. Let me minimize this little screen here. Okay. Um, next question. What draws you to writing comics rather than another format of writing, such as novels or plays or poetry? Um, we'll start with Paul again. Okay. Uh, for me, it's twofold. One, collaboration. I love working with other people. And in comics, it's kind of the, the best kind of collaboration for me in that it is, you know, a movie is amazing, but a movie is this giant group of people and there's a lot of money involved and there's a lot of other people involved. You know, so many people that it takes minutes to sit through and watch the credits, right? Uh, and video games, which I do for my day job, I love it, but also still a lot of people. Uh, with comics, it's me, the writer, and then one or two artists, right? Depending on if there's a penciler and an inker and a colorist uh, and an editor, and that can be it. Uh, so it can be a very small group of people coming up with lots of fun, creative things, but you're not on your own. Mm -hmm. Um, it's all, it's all, uh, as a group. Uh, secondly, uh, when it comes to prose, I really have a hard time writing a description and maybe that's cause I've gotten so used to comics. Like all I have to do is say, there's a tree. If it's important that that panel has a tree, right? You don't have to say, the, the tree's bark was this and its leaves were that. And like, I don't have to do any of that. The artist will take care of that. Right. So you're all about the dialogue. Yeah. So I'm all about the collaboration because I'm lazy. Is <laughs> what I guess I'm saying. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Shannon? Um, for me, it's kind of what Sean brought up, that it is a gateway to reading. Part of what I do when in the regular day job type thing is I run a comic book nonprofit and that is our mission is to encourage literacy and writing through comic books. And we take them into schools. We give them to kids. We work with them on everything from just what is the inference that you can get out of this picture and what is the, you know, how, what words did we learn from this comic book and what is the, what can we take away from it? And so for me, writing comics, it, it's partially because you do get to have that. You get to be a part of that gateway. You mm -hmm. can give them the the picture that goes with the word and they can say, okay, now I know what that phrase means because he's doing that right here. And I get it. And especially in those classic Silver Age comics where they're literally describing exactly what they're doing, you get exactly, okay, well, I know what that phrase means now because I mm -hmm. saw it and I read it and I can put those two ideas together. And so I love, I love getting to be a part of helping a kid find that and to find that sense of adventure because it builds this fantastic world for them that your imagination is already so big, especially in your young days and getting to like feel like you can step into it makes the world seem even bigger than what you can imagine because now you're inside of it and you can see it and you can feel it around you and then you can go off and you know, put sticks in your fingers and be Wolverine and then you can you wrap the cape around you and you're Supergirl or Superman. And so it just gives new life to just the words that they see on the page. And I just love getting to do that for kids and adults alike. Yeah. And, and graphic novels and comics for kids have really exploded in popularity. And I, you know, we're just so happy about that because it, like you said, it fosters so much and it's a great gateway to literacy. So yay on you for that. That's awesome. Um, how, about, how about you, Janet? It's funny because, um, oh, sorry, my computer sliding. Um, I, my, I actually have a, a degree in creative writing and fiction writing. Um, and that was what I went to grad school for. And I was about halfway through my program and real and started writing screenplays and realized that, um, that I, w what I wanted to do was visual storytelling, like the way I was thinking of my stories, the way I was kind of putting them down and, and pacing them. I was thinking of them as visual stories. And I had also done some comic book writing um, when I was in college and, and when I was younger. And I just really went in that direction. And I love comic book. I also write um, uh, screenplays, but I, I what I really love about comic book writing is that you have that, like Paul said, it's, it's like 
the, it can be an individual vision. It can be like a very intimate, like a reading experience with your reader that, you know, you're, you're, you've got some internal monologue and you, you're, you've got this very sort of, uh, it's a, it's a more intimate experience of reading rather than seeing something in a theater or, um, or on TV. But, um, but you also have that visual element to it. And I, I really like that about it. So. One of the things that people don't mention about, say, comics as opposed to seeing a, a screenplay or, uh, you know, in a film is that you can set your own pace with it. Whereas if something's a movie, you're stuck with however fast the director has decided the action needs to be. Whereas right. with a comic, you can savor the action on a page, you know, and that's one of the things, especially kids do it. So it's pretty neat. And how about you, Sean? Sure. Yeah, I think I think pros and comics um, both are are you know they're not passive. You know, you have to be a participant um, <clears throat> in order for them to to keep you know uh, to keep going. You have to decide to turn the page or read the next panel. And I, I like those a lot about pros and comics, but especially comics because um, you know comics is is a great combination of prose and film and television to me <clears throat> and obviously just graphic art um you know you get to do a little bit of all of it um you get to play with pacing and 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 with and with prose with narrative in ways that you can't in any other uh, genre and that's part of what i like about comics it's not why i chose it over the others uh why i chose it over the others is because i was insanely into them um, but I mean, you, like when I was in grade school, I, I, you know, I wrote a play for my second grade or third grade class that I started and directed, you know, um, in fifth grade, I wrote a, a serialized, uh, sequel to the movie Halloween, um, that I got to read in class every Friday. Um, and you know, they wouldn't allow this today, but you know, like the story had, had me, uh, me kill, kill, had Michael killing off like different classmates every week, <laughs> and everybody thought it was wow. everybody thought it was great. <laughs> and you know, but the teacher uh, the teacher just made sure that I had to say it was all a dream at the end, or all fake. You know, so I made it, it was all a movie set. Um, but uh, I, so I've always been interested in prose. I've been interested in screenwriting and and um, and playwriting, and you know every every kind of writing. And I you know I write for games now and. I've done a little bit of animation work, um, but but to me, comics was the it was the language I understood most intimately, most innately. Like just because I I consumed it so voraciously from a young age, and also you know um, um, there was also on a practical side, I had you know some ins in the industry because I had been going to comic conventions as a retailer and and. Um, had met people as a retailer and, you know, met people in the early internet days uh, as a retailer and as a, as a, uh, as a would be writer. And that was able to, you know, open some doors for me. So that, that was helpful too. Awesome. All right. So next, uh, what is your writing process like? Start with you, Paul. Uh, so I start from, usually just an idea, right? A couple of sentences. Uh, and then I'll add a few more sentences. I'll turn it into a paragraph as I start to flesh out the story. Uh, and then I'll add a little bit more and a little bit more. Uh, so I guess it's like, it's like building a house. I'm laying down the foundation and I'm putting up some walls and I'm putting up some interior walls and I'm putting on a roof, right? And I put the whole thing together uh, just a little bit at a time in this sort of additive process. And then I figure out what's wrong with it and start tearing out walls and ripping <laughs> up the floor and redoing it, which probably is a really bad way to build a house. <laughs> uh, not the most efficient, but uh, in story writing, I feel like I have to get it all done once mm -hmm. and then go back and fix it. And I don't tend to do like a full giant outline uh, I kind of build that outline as I go. I usually know roughly the beginning, the middle, and the end, mm -hmm. and then and then I fill in all of the details and and write and write and write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite until I have a finished script. And then and it goes to the artist, and then 
uh, usually in the editor, and then you get feedback, and then you go back and right do it again. What about you, Shannon? Do you write from an outline or? It kind of depends on what I'm writing. Uh, when I write young adult novels and I'm in that prose world, I actually will kind of do like Paul was just saying, I kind of start from whatever it is that's floating around in my head and I build from there. And a lot of times what will happen is I'll make an outline after I've got that first scene done. I'm like, okay, this sounds like this was actually the middle of this. I don't know how I got here. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really work as a beginning. So what happened before this? And I might make a sketched out outline of like a before. And then once I get back there, I'm like, okay, now to where do we go? And I might make a little bit of an outline for the rest of it, or it might just keep going because my brain will just keep typing and I don't know what's happening kind of situation until I get to that next stopping point and I have to make a, an idea of where I'm going from there. And a lot of times that includes random, I'm at a restaurant, not now, obviously, back in the day, I'd be at a restaurant or I'd be working on a sales floor and I would grab the first thing closest to me. And that's what I would write those outline notes on. And I'll have, I have shoe boxes that the lids are flat, that that's what I wrote the outline on. And I'm like, well, I have to keep this shoe box for <laughs> <laughs> going. And so it's all kinds of like, whatever, pieces that I need to go and put it all together. Um, when I did Evol Evolution Revolutionaries, that's actually based off of Free Runner's album of the same name. And so for that, I actually had to sit down and write out all of the al the each song title. And then what is the song about? And then how do they all connect together? So for that, that was one of the like complete opposite end of my brain because I had to start with an outline because it already existed and there was right. already a set order. And then I had to go from there and say, okay, if we tell this story, then how does that make th this? And what is the overarching theme and how do I make an overarching story out of an album that wasn't built for a story in that capacity? Like how do I now draw all these together and make characters and make a story that goes with it? So it kind of just depends on where, where the story is already when my brain gets a hold of it on how it do like drafts everything out from there. Mm -hmm. Neat. How about you, Janet? I'm, I'm definitely an outliner or at least like a, a I, I need some kind of structure before I start. And I, I go from beginning to end, but usually the way I connect with my characters to start with is I draw them. And I'm not actually an artist, like a professional artist, but it, it gives me a way for my brain to kind of think about who they are and what their expressions are and what they what they want. And, you know, kind of do that, you know, um, what's the what's, what's the acting term like method method drawing, I guess, or something. <laughs> and then I do like a really loose. I used to do much tighter outlines, but then I departed from them and it it, it was like I needed something to structure, but if I had too much structure, it, it didn't work. So I would, I would do my favorite things is like um, index cards. I'll do like scenes on index cards and then I'll write through it and, and I will still depart from it, but it gives me something to kind of hang on to. It's like, okay, on page thirties, we have to get to here. So, you know, I kind of write in chunks like that way. Mm -hmm. So that's usually how I do it. And you, Sean? For me, with um, with comics in particular, um, the way I tend to work is is I'll spend a lot of time writing in a physical notebook, um, which is basically just a way of me um, of me maintaining a thought process. Uh, because when I'm just thinking to myself, I can't keep you know I can't keep it uh, in line. I'll go ADHD into into all kinds of other tangents uh, and forget what I was even thinking about. Uh, so when I write it down, it's it's kind of like it's kind of like a memory that that sticks with me, you know, or th thoughts that stick with me as a memory. Um, I don't even go back and reread them necessarily. It's just to help me figure out what it is I'm writing about, uh, what who these characters are, kind of what the what the vibe is, what the theme is, what I want from it, um, and then from there I will go to an outline. Uh, it can be anything from you know. Uh, bullet point of scenes to um, a recent series I did um, that hasn't been released. Um, uh, you know, I wrote uh, page by page uh, beat sheets 
because I, I knew there was, I wanted it to be standalone stories. They were a set number of pages. There was a lot of information that needed to be passed along. And also you still have to have atmosphere and you still have to, you know, still have to have great uh, page turns. So I actually wrote out, you know, basically, um, you know, an outline sheet. And then I broke it down and like, what's a page? This is a page. This is a page. This is a page. Um, and that actually worked out really well for that project. But sometimes it, it will just be a single page of, of here are the five major things that I want out of it. Because, you know, I, I want to focus on the dialogue in, in the writing process. But I also want to allow myself the ability to make changes on the fly if I have to. So when it's really tightly uh, set up like that because of the plot, I can't really do that. And I couldn't right. do it anyway. But but in, in most of my stories, I want the ability to be able to to, uh, you know, realize things about the characters and 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 make uh, make an audible. Sorry, that's a sports reference. I don't know why I made a sports reference. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, basically, that's that's um, the variety of how I did. And sometimes it's by the seat of my pants. You know, mm -hmm. I, if I'm on deadline, uh, I just write it and hope and I have enough of a sense, hopefully, of how much story is in 20 pages or 24 or what or 12 was the last thing I wrote for uh, to, that I got paid for. At, well, and I wrote a one pager this year too. That was weird. But uh, <laughs> you know, you can, you get a sense of how much story will fit in that and just go for it. <laughs> right. Right. So you're all writers. Do you ever get any input on choosing an artist or feedback on the art? Um, you can answer in whatever order you want to. <laughs> uh, I, I get, over historically, I've gotten some ability with the bigger publishers to to talk about the art, um, like who the artist is, but not for the most part at those companies. Um, and I always get the art to look at, almost always get the art to look at. There are a couple editors who weren't big on that. Um, but most editors will want you to look at the artwork because they want you to notice if anything's off, because mm -hmm. you're going to have to rewrite it to fit what they what they drew because it's going to take them a lot longer uh, to redraw it, to right. patch it unless it's something egregious that that just doesn't make any sense then then they'll have them uh, the artist patch it in but um, but by and large yeah I mean they they want you to to have some input but um, not critical input to the point that they're going to start telling the artist to make changes based on on your preferences um, when it's something that's creator owned, you know, usually I'm sharing that credit with the artist and it's a conversation, you know, mm -hmm. um, and obviously I, you know, I, I'm a big part in selecting the artist, you know, you approach somebody and ask them, do you want to work with me? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I really like your work. Can you work with me? Yes, no, maybe. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, that, that's a relationship. It's a two way relationship and mm -hmm. you should just be open with each other um, as much as you can without being a jerk. Do you, any of you have a preference for working one way over the other? Um, you know, as a more of a collaboration, like Sean described, or you know, just uh, you know, they have this artist, we'll just go with whatever. I mean, in my experience, it's it does depend on the project and and the company and that kind of thing. Uh, I did a, a graphic novel series, Pantheon High. Uh, with a high school for demigods in present day Los Angeles for Tokyo Pop. And that was uh, an artist. I feel like the studio put us together, but I, I certainly had, oh no, maybe me and I pitched it together. I think we, we pitched it together. Um, I can't even remember now. God. Uh, <laughs> but, but I've had a lot of projects where the studio just said, here's who your partner is. Mm -hmm. um, and literally nine times out of ten, it's like, wow, this is great, and this is more than I ever could have hoped for, and this is fantastic. Uh, and then you do, uh, you change things around a little bit, right? Oh, this artist likes drawing this kind of thing, so I'm going to do more of that, or this mm -hmm. is what they're really good at. Um, and I've also had the reverse, like when I did Disney Princesses, uh, it's because I'd worked with Amy Meberson on... Monsters Inc. many years before, and we had remained friends. And she is just a, she's a fantastic person. She's an incredible artist. She's really smart. She's really talented. 
Uh, and Disney had hired her to do these Disney princess comic strips. And she's like, oh, you, you want to talk to Paul Benjamin? Mm -hmm. That's somebody you want to bring in. And so, yeah, it's almost, it's, it's just finding these people that you love collaborating with uh, is the perfect world. And other times you might have zero contact. Mm -hmm. I wrote it. <laughs> I gave it to the editor. The editor hired an artist. Um, I remember the first time Marvel said, hey, here's the lettering of the of the issue with all of your words in the word balloons. Give us notes. And I like made a few like typo changes or cleaned a few things up. They're like, no, really. Give us notes like tear stuff out if it doesn't need to be there. Add word balloons. If it's not clear. Uh, and that was a really cool experience to realize, yeah. oh, I really do get to come in here and uh, <laughs> make some changes now. Yeah, that had to have been unusual because of the way that, um, you know, most, as I, as you all say, most of these things work, you get the writing and then the art is separate. So. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, what everybody else said, it's, it's kind of a combination of, it depends on the, whether the project is really editorial driven or whether it's um, you know, create our own, like what the, what the publisher does, like, and as Sean said, like, who's available and, and who wants to work with you. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But like Angel City, when I was working at Angel City with Oni Press, I had a lot of input on who we hired, um, the editor, because it was a create our own project. The editor ran a lot of people past me. And some people were not available, um, but I really lucked out by getting Megan Levins uh, as my collaborator on that. And we, work together pretty closely. And, you know, after a few issues, you get to a point where you only see that character the way your collaborator draws them. And so I would, mm -hmm. I could write in a little bit of shorthand with her and kind of write to her strengths and be like, here's what's happening in this scene, you know, do, do what you will with it. Cause I knew that she would, you know, bring her own perspective to it. So, um, so that that's my favorite way to work is the more collaborative way, but there've been other ones where, I didn't even have anything to do with the choice and, uh, and you know, really almost no contact at all. So for me, more so than even art, my husband is a letterer. And so when I'm writing a script, he'll, walk, he'll even just walk up and say, that's, that's not going to fit in a panel. <laughs> you, you got to cut some of that out, make it separate thoughts, make it somewhere else like that. So it's, that's actually one of the most helpful things from collaboration point for me is having somebody who has to try to fit all of those words in those little bubbles, stand over my shoulder while I'm typing it and say, um, that's just, it's not, it's great. I love what you're writing, but it's not going to fit. And so that helps me a lot, especially when passing it on to the artist. And then the artist comes back and like they said, like a lot of times the art is, done and the words aren't going to fit in there and you're you have to adapt and so i can go to him and say you know what is the best way to do this for lettering purposes because now something's got to flip flop entirely or something's got to change how we say it and what's the best way to just make that make sense in that panel now so it's kind of right. like getting a little cheat sheet because i've got a letter in my house to take things to <laughs> but it's definitely helpful yeah, can I have them come over when I'm writing scripts? <laughs> right. <laughs> Look over all our shoulders. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I'm going to start, like, that's going to be his new service. I'm just going to be like, it's <laughs> just to look at the script initially and say, that's not going to fit in a book. Like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> just lend them out. <laughs> um, since you're all writing, um, when you write, are there any tropes that you either actively embrace or try to avoid? Um, I know some people, their writing style is full of, oh, well, they, if not this person's writing, if they don't have this trope in there involved, you know, feel free to answer in any order. I'm, I write young adult fiction, so my world is tropes. Um, <laughs> there are definitely a lot that I try to, I try ever, every so hard, ever so hard, every manuscript, every everything to control find the idea of somebody letting out a breath they were didn't know they were holding because that is in every YA book <laughs> in the world and every teenager will tell you to stop using it if you ever do it but for some reason it ends up in almost every YA book and so <laughs> that is one of those things that I'm constantly looking for just even the mention of that <laughs> they're just so dramatic you know <laughs> but uh, yeah go for it 
Uh, I was going to say the the trope that drives me nuts now uh, is the public gathered in front of like a store full of TV screens, <laughs> seeing whatever the news is telling you that like the author wants you to know about. Mm-hmm. Where does this happen? <laughs> Where, How how are, are you people hearing standing it? in front of windows of TVs now? <laughs> in the twentieth century, I think is when that happens. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, more likely you'd be standing in front of your phone going, you know. <laughs> On the other hand, writing a lot of superhero things, I definitely embrace the trope of uh, we solve our problems by punching each other. Mm-hmm. That is, uh, I mean, sometimes they don't. But by and large, there's a whole lot of uh, let's figure this out through violence. Mm-hmm. I, I like to write against that too, right? And also it depends on the character because it is a nice breath of fresh air when a character's like, wait, we just talk for five seconds like <laughs> let's not have a big fight okay we, we could try that out. <laughs> that worked wow yeah uh, trying trying to picture you know like the hulk sitting down for a parliamentarian debate you know? <laughs> hulk That's says funny. robert rule robert's rules of order <laughs> say you have floor exactly i want to read that now that would be <laughs> awesome <laughs> but, hulk, uh, master parliamentarian <laughs> I um I I my favorite thing to do is to take pop culture tropes and subvert them. So I try to do that um when I can. Like Angel City was definitely a, a, a noir, like a crime noir, and a lot of people when it came out um commented on the fact that the femme fatale was also the the lead character and the detective, which made my little heart happy. That was exactly what I was hoping people would would get from it. So that's what I like to do. I think when you think about tropes, like kind of the origin of every trope is is one of three things. Like either it was it was novel and clever, or it was it, it, it has a truth to it. And some tropes, you know, the the very negative ones are just like outdated. You know, <laughs> they were bad ideas to begin with, but <laughs> right. people kept using it because they saw it in something. Um, and so, like, I try to be conscious of 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 whether or not I'm using tropes. I think you can lean into tropes and you can, you know, try to try to do something novel with a trope. Um, but I think if you tried to like do no tropes, like you would come up with something very alien, <laughs> mm-hmm. like nobody would recognize it as, as, as a piece of entertainment or, or, or <laughs> it's, or it's just something that they would think it came from a bot maybe. Um, right. Hulk second that all opposed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I just, you know, that's, I, I try to recognize that I'm using a, a trope and I, I try to either uh, subvert it or, or, or replace it, you know, with, with something mm-hmm. else. And if it, you know, and if I can't come up with something, then I, I look for another way to tell it all together. And, you know, um, and sometimes you just do the trope. <laughs> sometimes right, right. You, just, but, you just have to do the trope. Uh, but uh, the yeah. one I, I really hate now is the, uh, and I can't believe it's still being used is She's right behind me, isn't she? <laughs> yeah, but I love what you said about subverting the trope, right? Because you you want to like, oh, I wrote the script and I wrote, she's right behind me, isn't she? And then when you actually do the script, you do, no. There's no one yeah, there. Right. There's, there. There's, there's absolutely nobody there. Yeah. And then you, know, you take that expectation, <laughs> no, <not> there. <laughs> right? And that's that's what some of the best, the best jokes are, especially if you look at... Uh, certain writers where they do this great job of here's the premise and here, you know, exactly what to expect and it gets your brain traveling down those tracks. And then when they switch tracks, it's suddenly like, Oh wow, this is great. I thought I knew exactly where it was going. And now you've surprised me. That's neat. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I always notice when um, I read reviews of kids entertainment in particularly is that they will complain about the use of tropes and the use of cliche and one of the things that I feel like they defer, don't take into consideration is that young kids, it's not a cliche to them. They've never ever seen it before. Mm-hmm. You know? So I think it, it's just a, 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 the best writers, as you say, know how to uh, incorporate it in a new and novel way. So, um, right, But you're right. It is, it is using, there is a certain language to stories that, that we're all used to. And we know, and like Sean said, you wouldn't, recognize it if it mm-hmm. weren't there. Right. So graphic novels, comics, web comics have all become more mainstream recently. Um, 
Has this changed anything in the way you uh, approach your work? Has it made it any easier to get published or recognition? I'll say for Anybody. me. Anybody? Yeah, uh, <laughs> for me, uh, you know, my first uh, comic book series was uh, a teen drama called The Waiting Place. And so, like, when I first started writing comics, I was always interested in reaching a mainstream audience that didn't exist in, in the comic book uh, business. Um, I mean, I, I started writing comics wanting to write Spider-Man, but, you know, I realized, well, what do I want to write if not somebody else's superhero character? And that's when I came up with that idea for The Wedding Place. And I was more influenced by television than by comics uh, in writing that series. Uh, and so I, I feel like comics, it, the comics audience is slowly drifting more toward the kind of things that I write. So that's mm -hmm. nice. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm enjoying where it's going, and I'm 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 embracing it. Uh, I would say it's affected me in the sense that I now work primarily in video games, mm -hmm. uh, and you know the fact that there are so many video games based on all of these properties that we love creates new opportunities for people to work in those in those worlds. I mean, I worked on the the DC Universe online game uh, for about a year and a half and got to write almost every DC character there is, right? And that, to me, was huge and exciting. Um, and it, it reaches a much, much bigger audience than any comic book does. Right when you have hundreds of thousands of people playing a video game and tens of thousands of people reading a successful comic book, right? It's a it's a whole different scale. Even though the comic book feels more real to me, right? That's the real continuity. Uh, it it actually doesn't have as big an audience as things like video games or now movies and TV, which is kind of delightful. But it all feeds back into itself, right? You need those comics to to keep those worlds alive. Mm -hmm. Which, to your point, they just dropped that Fortnite that has the Thor comic in it. And so you can read the actual script, like part of issue one of Donny Cates' Thor, and has an o its own new Thor and a bunch of other Marvel characters' adventure in there. And so there's a whole new generation of kids who are picking, who are usually glued to Fortnite, who now suddenly know who Thor is and are reading this Thor comic. And I had somebody come by here and, you know, to our store and say, oh, well, my son was just playing this Thor on Fortnite. Is that a thing? I don't know. He told me he was reading the comic and I, <laughs> what are you, don't touch my number one. And he's like, no, it's in the game. And <laughs> it was, it's crazy how many people, I mean, our, our nephew up in, you know, another state sent us a picture of him playing the game and pointing to the comic in it. And so it's such an exciting thing for these, these kids who haven't had, like you said, they haven't had that exposure necessarily to comics. They're finally, it's coming to their world. Mm -hmm. it's, it's growing it's not just and it's not just that the video game is a completely different story it's now we're tying that continuity into it and so you can go from playing your video game into the store and buy issue two mm -hmm. and move on with the story and keep going and i think that's such a a great way to continue to get a new generation you meet them where they are mm -hmm. and they're doing such a good job through that like with the work and those things with graphic novels on the bookshelves and with the comics in the video games and in the movies, like you're seeing so much of the kids coming in and wanting to learn more and wanting to go further and building that next generation. I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. cool. I think um, the thing that I worry about is, is comics and movies becoming so much the same that you kind of get this common denominator storytelling that is not as, as interesting or weird or strange as like, you know, uh, like in the nineties, I remember comics being this sort of place where you could do anything with these characters and nobody was really paying attention. So you could get really strange and creative and like, like Paul, I know you work for humanoids and like their main writer was Alexander Jodorowsky, who was completely crazy. Like his stories <laughs> were like out there. 
you're, yeah, you're not going to sell that to the mainstream, but it's a place where that can exist. And mm-hmm. I like that about comics and I don't want that to go away. Yeah. Um, but I, I do like that, that it's reaching a broader audience in a lot of other ways. So, yeah, I feel like Oni press in particular does a good job of bringing out some of the more uh, original things. Um, uh, we've been following the whole Tea Dragon Society series that uh, Katie O'Neill's been doing, and some of her world building is just yeah. really out there and interesting and new, and you're not seeing it everywhere else. So um, that's that's one of the things that I love about comics is that you can just go berserk in terms of the world building. So you know, it brings up a, a beautiful point that the you know that the thing about comics is there's a lot that you can do in comics that is exclusive to comics. Mm-hmm. I've been thinking about it more recently in terms of, and I'm not, I don't read a lot of comics right now, but you know, whenever I kind of look at the, at the Marvel in particular comics and they kind of, they kind of retrofit their, the comics to kind of feel more like the MCU. And I think about the old ridiculous costumes that characters used to have. And, and I, I think, you know what, we can still do ridiculous costumes in the comics. I, and I think it will not be so ridiculous. Um, I think that comics, you know, that that line art has a certain language that is different from from film and, and television. And it, it's okay to try to be realistic, but it, I think it's also okay to embrace what's unique to, to comics. Mm-hmm. No, I like that. I want to bring back Phantom Girl uh, bell bottoms while we're at it. <laughs> God, Legion of Superheroes in the seventies had the best outfits. Oh, they Phantom did. Girl bell bottoms. Cosmic Boy had a costume that was like cut out. It was like it <laughs> yeah, only, they were just, it only they went were over covered. here, and like it must have been held up by his magnetic powers. It must have had like metal wire in the thread because Supergirl was, had those shorts with the tassels. Yeah, a whole bunch of Hollywood fashion tape just like under there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very right. interesting outfits in the seventies, all all over. Yeah. <laughs> So what's a dream project you'd like to work on? If you could do any, you know, anything original, anything existing, whatever you can, you know, what would you love to work on? I I have a lot of original comics I have written and, and right, like, haven't done because then you have to go pay an artist and it's expensive and you might not make any money. Uh, and... That's why I do things that other people have paid for. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm too risk adverse. Uh, a project that would never happen that I would love to do, right? I need unlimited money to make this happen. Uh, I work a lot on MMO video games. Uh, is a Buffy the Vampire Slayer MMO, mm. right? Where, where you can, you're in the Buffy verse where it's sort of Bioware style where your decisions have consequences and can change your story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, you can play as a Slayer class or a vampire or a werewolf or a witch, right? Like, it's... That'd be cool. It's very pre-built for a really great uh, sort of Star Wars style mm-hmm. storytelling gameplay experience. But nobody's going to go pay for the Buffy license to go make that video game because it would cost a lot of money and yeah, they want all the money and it, it'd be a big risk. <laughs> if any investors out there have like are like, yes, this is where I want to spend my money, give me a call. Yeah. <laughs> it would be a license to print money, I think, but <laughs> people would love it. Um, I don't know. There's so many, there's so many original projects I want to do. And I find myself when this question is asked, thinking of like actual big two projects that I would want to do. And I would love to do X-Men. That's like the, my, my teenage, like heartthrob. I would love to do X-Men or new mutants or, um, Jessica Jones. Oh yeah. Do um, I have I have an idea for Cassandra Kane's uh, origin story that I would love to be able to do one day, but I don't know if that's ever going to happen. <laughs> so, never know. You never know. That's yeah, true. Yeah, you never know. Uh, it, it, I guess, um, like when I started, my dream project was to write the Amazing Spider-Man. 
Um, that never happened. I did get offered to be w- one of the writers on it at one time, but I had to turn it down. Uh, mm-hmm. But um, so that, you know, just getting invited was pretty much close enough, you know, and I got to write a bunch of Spider-Man. So I've, I've pretty much got that out of my system. Like, uh, like Janet was saying, like, when I think when people ask me dream project, like, like, I don't think about any of my original stuff. Cause like, like, like I can do those, you know, <laughs> like right. well, potentially, I mean, I've pitched a lot of my current originals and you know, it's not what people are looking for. Um, but um, um, I think, thinking in terms of the big two um i would i would love to get to do something that's standalone um at either place um and i have and i have one idea for both marvel and dc that i would love to do and the marvel one is is just very broadly a um a modern remake ongoing series based on the original uh secret wars um and like think of Secret Wars meets Lost. And that's kind of kind nice. of the idea. Um, and then at at DC, I'd love to do a, a Trinity ongoing series that's more like more like a YA series or or something something you know between in between Smallville and and the DC universe mm-hmm. uh, that where where all three of them are are the three stars and they all have their own arcs and everything and and just kind of building a whole tableau around those three characters of Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, for those who don't know who the Trinity are. <laughs> right. Um, and I mean, those are, those are like the things I think about sometimes when I'm just, when I'm actually trying to work on other things <laughs> <laughs> and, and those would be great. And then, and then actually Paul made me think of my expensive MMO that will never be made is for X-Men um, kind of to combine Paul and Janet's um, dreams um, <laughs> and it would be so expensive because you could start out at either, you know, uh, Xavier's Academy or with Emma Frost Hellions. And yeah. you can become in the end, either a hero or a villain. And so like, it, it makes a big, you know, story X, but like, there are so many different threads you could like the X take, like it's so expensive. <laughs> so expensive. <laughs> So that's, There's so many I guess I do have some great projects after all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How did you, Shannon? Um, my, I guess going big to like big two dream projects and to Sean's point, the thing I work on when I should be working on other things, dream project is I actually want to write a teen story around the idea of like Black Bolt finding out that he can't use his voice ever again as a teenager. Oh, yeah. This uh. kind of, like him, like having to, like that whole process of like what happens when, because that's how teenagers feel. Every mm-hmm. teenager feels like their mm-hmm. voices matter. Nope. So I wanted to, and so I actually have a document on my computer called that Black Bolt book Marvel will never let me write. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I always throw it in there every time I'm like supposed to be working on something else. I'm like, well, what's Black Bolt doing right now? <laughs> <laughs> my brain needs to go talk to him for a little bit. And so I, that's my ultimate like Marvel dream project is just this. And I guess in that same, almost in the similar vein, I just, as like a witchy person, I've always just wanted to write Zatanna and just, Oh yeah. You know, story, so, and I would love to do it with Megan Hutchinson who did the rock stars book because she has that dark gritty art. And I think it would be an amazing thing in my brain. It happens all the time. Zatanna. Again, it's wonderful. Uh, that was DC hire Shannon for Zatanna back. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're almost out of time. So the last one I'm going to ask is um, what's your favorite comic or web comic you've read in the last year? It doesn't have to be something new, just something new to you. Mm. Uh,. Mm. There, there are a few for me, but but Shannon made this one easy uh, earlier because she was talking about Lois Lane, uh, the the Greg Rucker written Lois Lane series that DC has been doing is and sorry if I just stole it from you, Shannon. Oh, okay. <laughs> Everybody could uh, talk about that. <laughs> but it is it is out of the, this world because it is Lois very much in the DC universe dealing with super villain related stuff, but she is an investigative journalist doing the job of an investigative journalist and digging into like 
the truth of what people in power are doing. Mm-hmm. And it is it is just a breath of fresh air to see that, uh, you know, the search for actual empirical truth by journalists being put out there in the guise of Lois, who is this amazing, wonderful character. Uh, and it's also great because, like, Superman keeps trying to help and Lois keeps going, honey, I got it. <laughs> like, you're not going to be helping here. You're just going to be in the way. I got it. And he's like, all right, honey, I'm out. <laughs> I need to check that out. Uh, my favorite my years are starting to run together for me with the pandemic. But uh, my favorite thing I've recently read is Vita Ayala's um, The Wilds, which I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it's it's I think it's Vault. Is it Vault Comics? Um but it's it's really original. It's like a it's a dystopian future, but it's one where like plants have grown over everything and are growing into people. So it's like a virus, but you can the people with the virus have like plants growing over them. And there's this enforcer woman who's driving like a late you know model muscle car that goes around killing all of the trying to. Try, she's a, a courier back and forth between the the cities that are not infected yet. And so she's got to kind of go through the wilds and it's, it's neat. It's, it's very original. I like it a lot. So. Sounds cool. Yeah. Sounds really cool. Definitely recommend it. So. Vault is doing interesting stuff. Yes. They have a lot of good titles. Uh, I believe no one's roses from vault as well. And if you liked the wilds, you would love no one's roses. It's also about like they're living in a biodome type thing because they've been told that the world outside is destroyed and it's also got plant type people and revolution. It's, it's great. And I think it's a five, six part series. So it's about to come to an end, but it's also been really good. And the artwork is extraordinary to go with it. So that's mm-hmm. not, that's totally like just throw that your way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right now, at least a couple years behind on my reading. Um, but a uh, series that I've, I've found to be uh, uh, really worth my time is uh, the Immortal Hulk over at Marvel. Oh yeah, uh, it's uh, Al Ewing and Joe Bennett, and it's coming to an end, I think, uh, um, this year. But uh, uh, it's you know you, you have these characters that have been around for decades and decades, and you think no one's ever going to have a fresh take on this anymore, especially not after ten years of Peter David doing earth shattering things with the character and. Um, you know, so, so many great runs that, and takes that, have, that there have been out there, um, including the four issues that I wrote, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, he, you know, he, he took it kind of back to its, the character back to his roots as, as, you know, a, a take on, on the sort of universal horror characters in the fifties horror, uh, uh, craze. And, and it's a dark and, and intimidating look at the character, um, you know, and it, you know, it's, it's just a wonderful uh, horror comic really. And it fits into the Marvel universe without you feeling lost, but, he <laughs> uses, but uh, uh, Al Ewing uses um, all kinds of um, little bits and pieces from all over the Marvel universe. Um, it's, you know, it's a credit to his writing. It's a credit to Joe Bennett's longevity. Um, I mean, I drew, uh, or Joe drew my three of my four issues of the Hulk back in 2001, <laughs> you know, 2002. Um, and here he is, you know, he's still, he's still going strong. And I, you know, I would recommend that series very highly. Awesome. I, I do a Sunday night show where I talk about comics with my husband every week and we talk about almost everything that came out that week. And we're supposed to have a category that's picks of the week. And my stack is always like this big. (laughs) It's very hard for me to answer this question with just one title. And we, there's so many things that are going on right now. Like you said, like Mortal Hulk, Lois Lane was so great. Lois Lane actually won um, with our like voters and everything on our show. It actually won the second best series of all of last year into this year, like 2019, 2020. Uh, losing to Chip Zdarsky's Daredevil, which, if you haven't read, is also a phenomenal title. Yeah. Uh, but we, like, there's so so many good things. And I think, for me, um, two parts, like, individual series, just in general, that I love the most that I always have to read first is Ice Cream Man. 
which is terrifyingly um, not for teens or kids, um, but it's a horror anthology. And each issue kind of takes on a different aspect of humanity. And it's done in that creep show, like Tales from the Crypt kind of mentality and style and like the wording, the art, everything. But they also play with the medium. Issues that are entire palindromes. There are silent issues that tell three stories at one time that are supposed to be Neapolitan ice cream flavor. And oh. there's just so many things that go on in that book. And I think that is one of the best books out there right now. And then the other thing is there is a new publishing company from Axel Alonso and J. Michael Straczynski called AWA. And their imprint is Upshot right now that they've been pushing everything on. And they launched during COVID. Their first book came out about a week before comic book stores shut down. For oh, wow. And uh, they've been pushing everything out since then. And everything that they're doing is just so good. They're, ironically, the issue that they launched right before COVID was a book about a virus that destroyed the entire world. Um, mm. <laughs> and fits very much in line with uh, things that we've seen happen in the world. But there's been so many good, there's such good commentary in each book. Every book kind of tackles a different thing. All of the writers are and artists are coming from different aspects. Like we've got grindhouse style books. We've got a retail. There's a retail. We I don't work there. Um, there's a <laughs> selling of Beowulf that takes place in Kentucky in the 70s. There's and stars a biker gang of women. And there's just the women dealing with human trafficking issues in some books. And then there's books that deal with, like I said, the virus. And there's deal, books that deal with issues on. The border but all of them are wrapped in these great amazing stories and so as a whole like that entire publishing house is just <laughs> what i'm reading I, like that is like a oh my gosh there's a new book coming out from that and of course they have like zombie books and things too mm -hmm. so it's like you grab it each week and you just gotta know like whatever title it is you're jumping in on that one that week because it's gonna be so good so. well that's certainly plenty to recommend so now people have lots to look for <laughs> Um, well, we are actually over time from what Betty told me. So uh, I'm going to say thank you to all so much. I'm going to end our recording now and hopefully everyone will enjoy this and our other panels at the fifth annual LibCon from Pflugerville Public Library. Thanks, awesome. Thanks, Thanks, y'all. Thank you.